Howdy. My name is William Burns, and I'm a professor at Texas A&M University School of Law. I'm going to talk to you today about the two courses for this summer in our international tax curriculum. Course number one is uh, three different names, FATCA, Common Reporting Standard, and Automatic Exchange of Information as its primary topic area under the heading Tax Risk Management. And our second course is International Tax Risk Management. Each course has six weeks of weekly case studies that have been developed by uh, top faculty experts. Our next slides, I'll, I'll go over our team of really eight excellent uh, faculty that we've assembled uh, for the summer to lead, uh, create, lead uh, the, dis the discussions, the case studies, and to help really evolve um, the program to the next level. So as you'll read on the slide before you, um, I encourage you also, of course, to go into the syllabus um, at this stage, which is about two weeks before your class begins, and take a look at the topic areas that you're gonna be covering uh, this summer. These are not the only topic areas. These are the primary topic areas for each week's case study. Basically, the learning outcomes, or if you will, the discussion points that are the center focus of that week's case study. There'll be, of course, other topics discussed uh, and learned through the process. So as you see on the slide before you, in the, in the six weeks, of the FACT SCRS and Automatic Exchange of Information course. We start with uh, FACT SCRS and its global uh, implications uh, through examining it in the context of the European Union. And uh, Dr. Bruno De Silva uh, will be leading, has designed that case study, will be leading it. Dr. Bruno de Silva is also an author within my tax treatise uh, on FACA and CRS. On May 25th, in the second week, uh, Denise Hinsky, who is, a, we'll get to the bios moments, so I won't go through each of their bios, but uh, she's going to be covering uh, FACA CRS in the context, specific context of the asset management industry. Um, but she's also in her following week, June 1st, going to bring her 30 years of compliance, uh, technology, uh, experience that she's obtained in the big four where she now leads a global unit and a couple hundred employees uh, addressing these matters for professional institutions and large companies. Uh, after Bruno, who comes from a law firm, big law world, Boyens and Loof, and Denise, who comes from a uh, big four world, uh, Deloitte, we're gonna move into what's called the government world. So Melissa Muhammad, uh, who's taught in this program um, years past, uh, is, uh, works for the Internal Revenue Service, LBNI, and she's going to be approaching this uh, topic area of FAC and CRS from a documentation uh, in the United States, we might call it like W8 system or 1042 system, but regardless, she'll be looking at documentation uh, from many different countries. She has lived overseas in different countries, such as Japan, uh, France. Uh, she's learned the local languages. She's actually worked in their revenue department. And uh, so she's going to bring uh, two different case studies where she can have the student teams uh, working together to solve some you know, just some of those great challenge areas uh, that always exist uh, when we have two countries uh, trying to accomplish an objective of capturing data or, or revenue. And finally, we're going to bring in the financial industry perspective with Hayden Perriman uh, in week six, who's going to be talking about financial institution systems and their data collection and maintenance. 
uh, abilities, capabilities, the bad things that happen, and so forth. We'll, we'll get to Hayden's background in a moment. Now let's look at the next course. So for international tax risk management, we're going to start with Dr. Nit Olson. Dr. Uh, Olson graduated from a previous version of this program uh, in uh, around 2002, so about 18 years ago. Uh, at the time, he was working for the Norwegian Revenue Authority, or the Norwegian Tax Authority. Uh, Dr. Nid Olsen is one of the world's uh, you know, em eminent experts, um, recognized experts on taxation of oil and gas. Uh, of course, Norway uh, uh, certainly has oil and gas in the North Sea, but I think more relevant, certainly more relevant for this course, is his uh, is his expertise on tax risk management from a uh, systems perspective and specifically uh, a government audit systems perspective and he's going to be uh, working through a case study uh, with y'all on using ISO 9002 as the control as the quality control feature and, and he has chapters in a book on this he had a lot of writing so it's a it's it's a really interesting approach um, that he's developed over again it, it was just like Denise over three decades um, going on four decades of experience um, from the government and from the taxpayer side we're going to come back with Bruno and Bruno's going to bring us into BEPS um, as you'll see from Bruno's bio uh, Although he works with Lloyds and Luth, the large law firm, he also happens to be the International Tax Council uh, for the Special Administrative Region in the CAL, which is of uh, which is a um, of course part of the uh, PRC, um, People's Republic of China. Um, and in that context, uh, Bruno has a lot of dealings with the OECD, United Nations, uh, Asian, and other you know, intergovernmental organizations, and and uh, part of that has been certainly on the BEPS project. So uh, for that week, we'll, we'll do a case study specific on BEPS and we'll cover different aspects of BEPS. We won't cover any transfer pricing aspects of BEPS because we've of course done that uh, in spring semester in the transfer pricing course. On June 1st, we're gonna move in with David Deputy. David Deputy uh, is gonna bring in country by country reporting and analytic systems. Uh, David runs uh, uh, was head of tax data at Vertex, a billion dollar um, tax technology company uh, that was you know, been in business a long time with transaction taxes, and then VAT. Um, and David's really uh, pushed the envelope on understanding systems and technology on a, on a very large scale uh, because he comes from a transaction tax background. That's just a fancy way of saying in the United States at least sales tax. <laughs> Um, but, you know, because, he, you know, if you're looking at like a Walmart that has price points in several thousand stores across the United States with uh, tens of millions of transactions uh, with different codings, you know, there's over 1,000 tax municipalities, uh, sales tax municipalities in the United States. There's the 50 states, but actually each municipality, each uh, county and so forth has their own uh, sales tax or as ICE tax system, use tax system. And uh, so... Vertex in particular, you know, is one of those companies um, that is, uh, you know, a software provider, if you will, a technology provider um, addressing big data and uh, in the context of tax risk management. So David's going to be uh, presenting us a case study um, that he's developed on that. Uh, we'll be back with Bruno, who's going to be talking about limitation of benefits. And, uh, and other aspects of tax treaties, like principal purpose test, the MLI itself, um, created through the BEPS project that has the ability to alter treaties with, uh, in the future, but with retroactive effect. Now, you know, is that gonna be accurate of all countries or not? That, that's, so that week's uh, case study um, won't specifically be on the MLI, but that week's, uh, but during that week we will discuss um, MLI and, and of course CBCR, um, which we've discussed the week before. We're going to bring that into the context of the uh, of, of that week. So um, we'll move on 
with Dr. Paula DeVitt of our School of Engineering. Uh, she is not a tax person. Paula is bringing to the table uh, her mathematics background, her PhD in systems and, and computer science, um, her big data and cybersecurity background, um, her law degree. She's bringing this multidisciplinary perspective uh, that she's again 30 years in industry um, and approaching tax solely from the perspective of a data management issue and a risk of that data. And I don't mean like lost data in cybersecurity and so forth. I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, data from finance, financials to, uh, to the tax account, from um, being able to develop rules within a system uh, that will quantify risk so that that risk can be communicated from, by example, a, a director of tax to a CFO. Uh, so Paul is going to be um, looking at the future of analytics and technology in the context of that. Now, this will not be the only time we talk about that. This, for this course, you'll see, in, in, when, for those of you who continue with fall, you'll see we have uh, three weeks uh, further on tax technology and risk management uh, being brought to us. Okay, we're gonna end our International Tax Risk Management uh, one course, because there, there are two, there's one in fall, I mentioned. We're gonna end that course with Melissa Mohammed and uh, bringing it home with, uh, with financial, uh, uh, like debt equity, uh, interest payments, EBITDA, thin capitalization. Um, and she's gonna bring that home so that we can match it with uh, Hayden Perriman, who will be, who's also a banker. Um, so let me go to the bios, um, but you'll you'll see it's it's a it's a perfect match to bring those two in together. Um, so Hayden will be leading a case study with financial institution systems in his in the back of course, and then separately Melissa and her um, for her week in the International Tax Risk Management course. For those of you doing both courses, it'll be a very nice compliment. The capstone for both courses is the students will come together and we'll do a week on tax technology and the future of tax departments. So uh, Deborah uh, Correa Tolucci, who's, uh, who's been lecturing with us already in spring, uh, will come back and she, she'll have invited guests and we'll go through heads of tax departments. And of course, she's with a large technology company herself and has been for her last two positions uh, where she's led transfer pricing or led tax uh, provisioning uh, at large technology companies. Uh, she's going to um, really expand on what we left off in the capstone week of, of uh, spring. And, and then she's going to do it again for, um, for the following fall. And so you're going to see kind of a, uh, it's, it's all going to come together as you're working through the program. You're going to have these capstone um, discussions with, with heads of tax of large multinationals who have developed discussion material and case studies that are going to be looking, forecasting the future of where they think their job is going to go and how it's going to go there. And uh, so anyway, stay put for that. So let's turn to what makes this actually all work. Our excellent faculty and staff. So you're gonna have, as I say, Denise uh, in, in FACA, and she's the light managing director, um, for, not just for FACA, but for reporting in general. And it's not just in the United States, but it's a global uh, position. And she brings us 30 years of experience. So she's, you know, been, representing uh, a lot of banks in their compliance initiatives since the enactment of FACA back in you know 2010, 2012 when the regulations finally got uh, uh, really finalized. So, so uh, Denise is, uh, is going to be bringing a real practical, real you know, advisor perspective uh, to FACA and CRS for us and all the conflicts that she's experienced um, globally trying to implement either FACA or CRS or other uh, automatic exchange of information uh, system uh, within financial institutions or large companies, treasury management centers, and so forth. 
And then, so anyway, it'll be very interesting uh, two weeks with, uh, with Denise. Um, well, most of y'all know Bruno from our, from our fall and uh, spring courses. So Bruno is uh, um, coming back because as you see, he represents, uh, he's the legal advisor of the Financial Services Bureau, which is the tax authority uh, for Macau. And so he's been working uh, again with systems and data and risk management, uh, specifically looking at the potential for analytics of that information and how uh, you know, the countries are geopolitically um, discussing that with each other. Which brings me to Melissa Muhammad, because Melissa Muhammad also worked at the OECD for a couple of years on behalf of the IRS, uh, where she was specifically in, involved in both FAC implementation, CRS, but in the geopolitics of tax authorities trying to work out system issues that they know they're going to have, but they just, you know, can't come to common agreement quite yet on. And, uh, and so she's going to bring um, her governmental perspective, if you will. Melissa is also fluent in Japanese because she worked for two years, uh, longer than two years, in, in uh, the Japanese tax authority as a um, position there by the U.S. Treasury uh, to, to cross culturally, you know, teach the Japanese tax authority about how U.S. Treasury operates and vice versa to learn how the Japanese tax authority can bring that back home to U.S. Treasury and, uh, and be that bridge uh, between two, you know, great trading nations. Hayden Perriman is, is a banker. He's not a tax person. He's a banker compliance uh, risk officer who's dealt with data and systems for the last 30 years for some of the world's largest banks. Uh, as you see on the screen, Bank of America, UBS, Barclays, RBS, Lloyds, and so on. So Hayden, whatever the new regulations or tax rules, FACA, the CRS is what, you know, what it is now, but uh, he qualified an intermediary uh, a decade or two ago now, I guess, two decades. Um, so, Whatever the new flavor of the of the compliance uh, for a particular regulatory scheme is, um, Hayden's been involved in that mix, and so he brings he's bringing uh, case studies uh, to the table uh, that he's you know by example for training his own staff and people at large financial institutions, or in communicating to a board of directors uh, that he needs buy-in. From for budgeting to set up the correct systems. Uh, so anyway, Hayden's going to talk about, if you will, the internal politics of the firm, the intra firm, and addressing risk and, uh, and, and and so forth. Hayden is one of the best analytics people I know, so he's also, of course, going to share some of his analytics knowledge as well as the other professors. Deborah at Veritas, um, but she's been at two other very large technology companies and before that was at a big four. Uh, she's going to uh, continue to bring her insights as large tax departments uh, mobilize better technology uh, to analyze whether it's uh, you know, their financials and the tax or they're analyzing tax data itself. Um, in the context of maybe country by country reporting. Um, so she's gonna continue to bring that conversation to us in summer. And, uh, and she's also you know, really, as you've seen before, an excellent moderator of, uh, of, 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 of other speakers who come on. And uh, because she is herself a tax director, she can uh, talk with them you know, on an equal tax director to tax director level. And I think it's important for the student body, and I, most of y'all have you know, 20 plus years experience and you're very involved in tax, but you know, you're, we have several people for automotive and maybe you don't know the technology industry and we have people in the, you know, maybe we have technology industry, but they don't know the oil and gas industry and so forth. So Deborah's, you know, specifically looking for diversity of perspective, tax perspective, if you will, from different industries that she's uh, going to be bringing to the conversation this, uh, this semester. I mentioned Newt Olson. Um, his transfer pricing risk mitigation and ISO uh, really 
really interesting approach that he's uh, he's been uh, pounding for 10, 15 years and uh, as, as an effective way of risk mitigation. And uh, so, yeah, 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of companies talking about, you know, risk analytics, uh, you know, being able to quantify risk, uh, much less mitigate that risk um, in the context of tax. And uh, because it came out of a, a tax authority uh, perspective for most of his life, and then he went with all that knowledge and undertook uh, a long PhD process to put that knowledge to paper in a coherent, if you will, uh, um, academic uh, work. But the academic work, he has spun off so many practical applications for large uh, multinationals. And uh, again, as, as you can see in their risk, mit in their risk mitigation, and he's come up with, I, I think, some really interesting uh, mitigation ways like using ISO and, and so forth. Um, so, so Nick will be bringing, and for those of you in the oil and gas industry in the program, um, again, he is, he is considered, well, you can look at his IBFD book, but he's considered one of the uh, uh, world's experts on, especially he's the world expert on cross-border pipelines. We come with uh, my colleague here at Texas a and Paula DeVitt. Uh, Paula is a uh, amazing uh, academic. Uh, she had come, comes from a mathematics background, a computer engineering background. Uh, she's a lawyer. She actually also has a master's of education. Uh, she is, uh, she's been uh, director of our cybersecurity institute. She serves at the Maritime Institute. She's at the College of Engineering. She's with me at the law school. Um, she is, she's a bundle of energy and, uh, and she brings more than 20 years of actual, you know, professional experience in the risk industry. And again, she comes from a true mathematics, uh, background of being able to approach risk, you know, from a numbers game, from a quantification game, from an evidence-based game. So she teaches in the program in the risk management courses in this program, like legal risk management. Obviously, she teaches a lot of cybersecurity. But, uh, but I've invited her to spend some time with us to, to bring the newest concepts of risk and analytics to our discussion that as tax, you know, as tax people, we become so focused, so myopic in our world. Or if we stretch outside of our world, it's to the financial account right it's to talk to the cfo but what we don't have the time if you will uh, the resource of time even if we have the resource of budget is to by example go to these you know tax uh, sorry not tax but risk technology conferences to understand what, what are some of the new uh, protocols um, typologies of risk so okay she's going to lead that conversation. She's, she's talking with the other faculty members. Um, we've been talking now for a year about this and, uh, and you know, she asked me questions about tax and you know, to, again for her it's just data and uh, you know, collecting data, managing data, cleaning data. What do you do with the data? And then it's from her lawyer side, you know, what rules apply, the rules gray, do the rules conflict, can the rules even, you know, do they have meaning in the context of scalable software? Uh, so it, she's going to basically challenge us as tax people to think outside the tax box and uh, with her case study. And finally, I mentioned we have David Deputy, who started off as a tax director over at Vertex, and now he's head of strategic development and emerging markets. But one of the things he did to start off with strategic development emerging markets was develop a country-by-country -country, uh, reporting software under the umbrella of Vertex, that Vertex went and gave away to the developing countries to use to be able to collect data from both domestic and then foreign sources. And collecting data is one thing, but data for the sake of data is, is uh, well, just costly. <laughs> uh, to make it actually have value, of course, one has to use analytic tools. So David's going to his case study is going to be focused on some of those analytic tools 
that, uh, you know, there's examples of Vertex and, and, you know, it's not about marketing Vertex, you know, Ryan, uh, a competitor is you know, headquartered in Dallas. Um, but, uh, but it's, you know, Vertex is an industry leader and there are other industry leaders in tax technology that will be bringing throughout the program. And, uh, but for, for this purpose, we're going to, we're going to look at Vertex. You, most of y'all uh, enjoyed four weeks with Dr. George Salas, who's the principal economist at Vertex and, and, and tax advisor. And uh, George, uh, also like Ned Olson, uh, graduated from this program 20 years ago, 19 years ago, uh, and has taught the program since then, <laughs> so for 20 years. Um, so George introduced me to David uh, maybe six years ago, seven years ago. And, uh, and David has moved from you know, the tax world to uh, the CBCR, okay, that I mentioned, but he's actually moved into the uh, blockchain world. And he's the leader of the uh, industry, um, uh, government relations, if you will, like I call it lobbyists, but uh, of, of the industry for blockchain and uh, the really big industrial companies that are looking at blockchain to uh, whether it can create efficiencies for them in their supply chain or what have you. So, uh, so uh, we're, this is not a blockchain course, that's a different course, but uh, it's just David's background. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out to him. As you'll read in the syllabus, of course, there are learning goals for both FACA and for international tax uh, risk management, you know, but importantly, uh, this is not just your common tax course. Uh, none of this program is. While, of course, we teach law and regulation, and tax treaty law and interpretation and so forth as lawyers must learn, we go well beyond that with the risk and compliance, the uh, analyzing and preparing uh, internal audit and risk reports. Uh, and, 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 you know, as, as in, at the end of the day, to analyze. It's all about, you know, to analyze data and, and analytics. And finally, as you see, number five on the board, uh, being able to communicate that, and uh, which lawyers are very good at doing. So, as you saw with my eight faculty members for the summer, you know, tax risk is multidisciplinary. So, when we approach FACA, we approach international tax risk management, we're approaching it from this multidisciplinary perspective. And I, we're not, you know, Johnny come lately to the scene. This is uh, 20 two years in the United States now, 22 years of teaching tax from the perspective of tax risk management and, uh, and risk, therefore, analytics. So, um, so we're bringing, you know, years and years of experience teaching this, but every three or four years, this is actually version seven of, of this program. And uh, so, yeah, version seven. So about every three years, uh, you know, we, we have to redevelop it because this, the world changes and moves on. So we have to redo all the courses and so forth. And, and so you've been experiencing that through our, through our fall and spring, and you'll continue to experience that in the summer. Uh, I think, you know, some of the interesting um, aspects of our, of our, of our program are that we have such a diversity of faculty um, from different backgrounds, different industries, uh, different academic or professional specialties. Uh, many of them have mixed academic, uh, you know, professionals and also academics, you know, accountants and lawyers or mathematicians and engineers and so on. So, uh, you know, I think that diversity has, you know, in, in the more courses you take in the program, of course, the more exposure you have to the faculty and to each other. And you all as the students, of course, bring just as much diversity and we'll continue to expand that diversity as we attract uh, new high level, high quality, you know, good students with lots of years of experience as, as we all have. We're gonna be using eCampus this semester. Now I know for the last two semesters I said that and I got lazy and we went on Google Drive. Okay, one of the reasons is because I don't have any more storage and I have to explain this. I, I, I can't upload videos to eCampus anymore. My storage is long ago on blown out um, because uh, what, I have two or three hundred eCampus courses under my name since I, of course, founded the online programs. But uh, the, uh, 
the eCampus uh, will be run by the, uh, the instructional design department uh, uh, at Texas A&M, and uh, which, uh, thank God, it'll load off me, but also um, more storage capacity. So, uh, so we're moving back from Google Drive to eCampus, which is this semester Blackboard. Uh, from fall, Texas A&M will be implementing Canvas as a learning management system, as well as like most other state universities in Texas. Um, so we'll, you know, I'll do a, you know, webinar and a video on like what the difference is between Blackboard and Canvas. But the reality is, Canvas is easier to use. So it's you're not having to learn more. It's really about hey, I don't, you know, where'd my button go? But uh, but Canvas is more intuitive. I'm certain, just less bells and whistles. Um, but reality is most faculty aren't technology uh, or media uh, focused and therefore they don't use the bells and whistles that are there. The course materials will, at least for the FACA uh, course, FACA CRS course, be my treatise as you've seen in all the other courses, it's one of my treatises. For the International Tax Risk Management One course, I'm, we're, we're still developing the materials. Yes, I can pull from the treatises and so forth. And you have access to all these treatises. Nothing's, you know, it's not going to cost you any money this summer. Um, you, everyone has a Lexis password. Um, so obviously, as you can see on the screen, this is a Lexis, uh, one of my Lexis books. But regardless, the, we're in international tax risk management because the field is developing so fast and that's so new and so forth. Uh, we're also going to be bringing in um, you know, articles and, you know, studies and, it's, you know, it's risk. So we're going to be bringing in non-tax but risk-related from our other courses. And, uh, of course, all of you, every case study will be brand new. So, um, so I, uh, you know, at least for the fact, of course, I can tell you all the course materials are in there and built. For International Tax Risk Management, well, we still got two weeks and uh, we had a faculty meeting this morning. And we'll have several more of those as we as we finalize each of our, our six weeks and the faculty are talking, of course, and, and then they can decide amongst themselves how this will best uh, play out in terms of materials. We don't want to just, you know, burden you with, oh, go read 2,000 pages. That doesn't make sense. You don't have time. And you would spend no time on the case study. So we want to make sure we're really efficient with the, uh, with the reading you do require that, it, you know, it's directly applicable to the learning and the case study process. I mean, if, like last semester, we'll have you know, suggested materials that you can you know, save away and read on a rainy day or a COVID day. The first thing I want everyone to do when you get to campus though, is, uh, is, is go to the social biography board. So some of you posted social biographies uh, in fall and spring, some not, but that's my fault because we were using the Google campus and it, it doesn't really lend itself to um, to a discussion forum, but but Blackboard and, and Canvas in the fall does. So it's really important that you go before you even look at a syllabus or anything in that course. Go straight to the forum called Social Biography. Post yours, and, uh, and if you've forgotten what a social biography is, go click on mine. Mine will be the first one as the example, and that's the way we create that intra team, intra-group, intra-cohorts, networking amongst y'all and y'all amongst the faculty. Faculty have their social bios on. And it's that coffee talk, the bar talk, what have you, that you can't do because you're separated by distance right now. But if you watch our videos of our previous courses, I have some up and I have permission. Yes, of course, I do get permission, like I'll ask y'all for permission to be in this course. But uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of camaraderie and, you know, we're gagging each other, I feel like, you know, I'm like being English about it, and, you know, doing funny little jokes with each other uh, through the lectures, or they're not lectures, but the, through the discussions and the case studies, because we, through the social bio process, have gotten to know each other, and the cohorts become quite cohesive, especially because they're working on teams. So you will see forums like I've had in the uh, Google Drive, you'll see this in the eCampus, week by week with the name of who's teaching that week. And it's not, there'll be teachers in a woven through the week. So just because Bruno's not the head of a week, the primary teacher doesn't mean he might, not, you know, he might participate also as you've already seen in our other courses, but somebody has to be the, 
primary head for that week. And because uh, they had to write the case study and they have to, they have to coordinate and lead it. So, um, so you'll have everybody's name by week as you already have in your syllabus written out in the main topic of the, of the case study. If it is a mnemonic device, of course, the same information will be in the syllabus. We are going to continue to use our flipped classroom approach that I've used for 20 years, um, which means we're going to, you know, you, you are already doing it. We have lots, you know, you'll have recorded lectures. So the classroom time won't be used for lecturing. That, that's the worst use of it. And sometimes, you know, as we've seen when the audio didn't work with the lectures in the recording process, you know, we can use the classroom time uh, to go through some lecture material. But regardless, most of that will be uh, posted a week or two beforehand, as, as you've seen in the past courses, and it will directly, those two, three, four, sometimes it's six or eight, recorded lectures will directly apply to the case studies. And, uh, and thus, each week will continue, as you've seen in the past courses, to be coherent um, onto its topic areas. And hopefully you've noticed a coherency um, through the syllabus of the entire course. If you don't, that's all my, that's not them. That's, I'm the coordinator, so I'm, it's my fault. But, uh, but hopefully you have noticed that. I mean, at least from the feedback you've given me so far, it seems to have made sense for you. Um, we're going to continue to use Zoom. Zoom is a permanent feature here at Texas A&M. Everybody has a Zoom account. 70,000 students, 70,000 student accounts, Zoom accounts. Um, so the difference is because of Zoom bombing and all the cyber Zoom you know, mayhem that was going on in spring because all of a sudden every program went online. So no longer was I the outlier. I was the leader, <laughs> the pioneer. Um, but uh, but uh, it also meant that you know Zoom that probably had you know a million users all of a sudden had a hundred million users or whatever um, and adopted Zoom overnight and um, and there was Zoom bombing I'm sure you've heard this so to access Zoom you are going to have to set up your Zoom account so if you didn't do it because you know guest link and all that you're not going to work anymore you have to have the Zoom credentials to come into the Zoom discussion, um, uh, lectures and case studies and so forth. So if you haven't set it up, go to the Zoom for Students and set it up with your UIN, your university identification number. And uh, you don't have to use it. You can forget it after you set it up. But just once you set it up, the system will recognize you for uh, entry. And that's what a Zoom looks like when our teams are discussing. So we'll continue to use teams uh, you know, for this uh, Summer semester, again, like the fall and spring, we're gonna keep the courses really short, you know, no more than 12 students, um, so that we can manage this process to make sure we have the best process and the next year we'll, we'll admit more numbers. But uh, um, for right now, uh, you know, we have our teams, three students a team. Um, the difference we're implementing this semester though, based on your feedback, but also feedback from faculty, uh, but it was mainly your feedback as students. Uh, whereas before, one member of a team was presenting, one was doing the PowerPoint, one was doing the memo each week, all three members are presenting each week. Yes, that's right. And if you can't present because you've got client work, you have to get one of your team members to present on your behalf. So all three, all presentations will have a hard stop. There'll be no going over time of, uh, of 12 minutes. That means each team member has four minutes to get their stakeholder point to win that day. And it'll continue to be a moot process with stakeholder positions and you'll be, and we won't let you get through your presentations. We will stir the pot and you know, you'll continue to post your PowerPoints, of course, before the day before so that we, the faculty, can you know, read through them and coordinate, and y'all read through each other's, and we can have a much better in-depth discussion. So we'll keep our friendly camaraderie of competition, um, but I think you know, the more that we prepare and the more that we facilitate that discussion, the deeper the discussion's gone, and so you've seen that with our three-hour you know, classes, so basically 90-minute classes that have run over. Here's another difference, and I don't have a good solution, 
So this is the solution. We're running two classes at the same time. That's not the way it's supposed to be, but summer only has one term. So is where each course has been uh, back to back before a B term, a B term. This time, fact and risk management will be running together. Consequentially, where we're going to have three morning live sessions instead of two, but that's better than four morning live sessions. The way we're going to do it. This is tentative. We'll, we'll finalize the schedule when we know who's enrolled for what courses. We'll send out the poll and make sure that everything fits in the timing. What we do know is that the courses will start at 8 a.m. Um, because that's the best time zone for the for those of you in China, Indonesia, Singapore, whatever. Um, so uh, 8 a.m. Texas time. Uh, although I really wish they started at nine. Um, but that's up to all the students. It's up to all the students. The one of the courses is going to be on Tuesday, and I forget which, but I, let's just say FACA is on Tuesday and International Tax Service Management is on Wednesday. So you look at the syllabus, it'll just say that. Again, the, 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 uh, the Friday or the weekend before the course, Saturday or Sunday, since no lecture will start before Tuesday, uh, we will post based on the poll um, which days were the best days. We know that Mondays never work for y'all. And we, for whatever reason, Fridays don't seem to be good, and uh, Saturday is not good. So it doesn't leave too many days. We have Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, we could do a Thursday, but um, regardless, here's the bad news. So Sunday, we're going to have to back to back lectures. So for those of you who are taking both courses, we're going to start at 8 until 9 30 for you know, one course, let's say FACA, and then 9 30 till 11 on the other course. So this is for the case study presentations. So one idea is we can move the case study presentations to the Tuesday and Wednesday and just use uh, Sunday for the discussions. But I, again, we're going to put this in the poll and let y'all give the feedback. But you know, it seems that the case study presentations have been best on the Sundays and uh, to get the uh, feel out of time to really you know, spend your, not the you spend Saturdays, but whatever. Somehow it seems y'all get very prepared and y'all gets done. And uh, so we had these great discussions. Um, but again, Sundays, we'll have a hard stop. Hard, hard, hard stop. 12 minutes, and we'll have a hard stop at 90 minutes because we got to go to the other course. So um, and that'll be a different Zoom link. So uh, because of the recording and all that as well. So uh, it will be a hard stop. So I know that sometimes our courses run two hours, two and a half hours, and we're all enjoying the conversation. That's why we're there. But, uh, but it must be a hard stop on Sundays. And, uh, otherwise, we'd have to do four days and I, I just don't think y'all I'm sure y'all won't have time so um you know us academics we just have to wake up and write but y'all actually have client work so um, or, or work through corporations so um okay anyway we'll send out a poll if y'all have a better suggestion than that I uh, will follow it but uh, but we can't do later in the day again because you know we do have Indonesia Shanghai and so forth we have to be respectful that when it's 8 a.m our time in Shanghai, they don't have daylight savings time. I think it's 9 p.m. So I think it's 8 a.m. for Suzanne in Indonesia. Okay. So uh, again, you get the poll. The IT help desk has been so brilliant this semester. It's always been good. I've been using it for years now, and 365 days, you know, seven days a week, um, you know, 24 hours a day. They're there at three in the morning. I want you, you know, to make sure that you feel comfortable, especially if you're a new student, you're watching this, uh, you know, to give them a call. They really will sort you out and, uh, or, you know, send them an email or chat or whatever you, you do. They really, you know, it's real Aggies. It's not outsourced. These are real Aggies managing 70,000 students and 8,000 full-time faculty and so forth. We're the largest public university in the United States and they get it done. I, just amazing, especially you know when I say get it done, amazing. It's COVID nineteen, and seventy thousand students were displaced, and teachers and so forth. And somehow technology managed the process. Uh, you know, hats off. This is this is that Aggie spirit and drive. Uh, amazing. Anyway, they're there for you, twenty four seven. So uh, uh, for those of you who didn't. Uh, probably all the, the people in the program have gone and explored both the 
law library and the uh, and the main campus library, the financial databases, Stanford of course, Thompson One, BBD, or IBFD, tax Meds, tax analysts, uh, CCH, Cheetah, whatever. You've explored, you've got your Lexus. But for the new students who are watching this, um, be sure that that you reach out to the law library. Uh, you know, as I tell everyone, I don't have a Google link saved or whatever. I, I just go every time I go on Google, same thing. T A N U, Texas A and M. T A N U Law Library, and uh, of course I can, say, and I can reach out to them. Now they're going to reach out to your students. I just if you missed the email and you or you didn't follow up with them, you know Google Tamu Law Library or Tamu New Campus Library. Uh, but th that's only to get your Lexus and your Bloomberg Law. You, they, you don't need anything from them to access the system. Uh, it's your UIN or your uh, or your Texas a and password. That you've set up that gives you grants you access to all these databases but if you need help and research and so forth you know they're there for that so um and and they'll send you out again a welcome letter and how the process works and, and so forth so you know be on the lookout for that if you haven't received it already you will receive it you know probably the weekend before before classes begin and so with that um i'll see y'all in zoom for the orientation uh uh, first set of lectures in uh, May 8th, the week of May 18th. Uh, I'll probably, uh, that weekend, the Sunday of May 17th, uh, I'll set up a Zoom for those who are new uh, or for those continuing. Because um, So for those who are new, the students, and I guess the professors like it so much that although technically spring semester ended two weeks ago, um, week seven, week eight and now week nine this week are uh the students have organized it okay deborah the capstone we we uh the, it was the suggestion and so we we've organized that but then week eight um covid's impact on transfer pricing and on risk um Pramod organized that and, and, and uh, most of the students showed up the faculty showed up it's fascinating fascinating and um and then they're organizing it a, another COVID discussion for this sunday on its impact on our tax treaties and so forth, which is, I mean, just our discussions are so good and deep that it's like you can't go to a webinar, one of these like, you know, continuing education webinars and get anything like it because this is a discussion as opposed to, you know, it's not somebody just throwing information at you and you get to chat in one question. You're actively part of the, of the process. So, um, so I'll, I, I think for that Sunday of May 17th, I'll organize a Q&A or a hello introduction, a social bio, and so the new people can meet the people in the program who are continuing for the summer, and we'll do introductions and all that. And uh, so that way we can really use our you know, first course meetings uh, effectively to discuss, uh, well, in fact, a case residency and the case of international tax list management and its um, approach. So uh, with that, if you have any questions, uh, be sure to reach out to me. You have my uh, details, contact details. You have my LinkedIn account, of course. So um, and join my LinkedIn group for international tax professionals. But uh, uh, reach out to David Dye if you need something, you know, at a high level, because you know, he's dean of the graduate programs, and then, and then David's staff, or if you need something from the registrar, the registrar staff. Even with COVID, even with the shutdown, um, Aggies are working hard. Everybody's uh, you know, telephony in, if you will, um, using Zoom with each other. In fact, I, 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 I am sure that I do more meetings now on Zoom with colleagues at the school than I do when I'm at the school. Now, maybe that's because we see each other in the hallway, so we don't need to. But regardless, it seems that uh, two, three times a day we're on Zoom with somebody. So, um, so I encourage you, you know, to reach out to us and, you know, get issues resolved before, uh, before the semester starts. So thank you very kindly for your time. Look forward to seeing you uh, probably May 17th. I'll send out a mass email. Thank you, guys. Cheers.